Right then, hi everyone, and uh, welcome to our 21st TI Centre seminar. And I'm delighted to introduce Professor Inti Slebet today. Uh, Inti is Professor of Digital Pathology at the Institute of Tissue Medicine and Pathology at the University of Bern. Originally from Montreal, she obtained her PhD in Experimental Pathology from McGill University, before completing a postdoc at the Institute of Pathology at the University Hospital Basel. And the aims of her current research group are on one hand to build tools for diagnostic clinical use, on the other hand, to gain novel biological insights into colorectal cancers by using the latest spatial tissue visualization techniques. And the title of Inti's talk today is, Does Tumor Budding Really Exist? How Digital Pathology Helps to Answer This Question Using 2D and 3D Technologies. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining us today, Inti. Thank you so much for having me here. It's really a, it's really an, a pleasure and an honor um, to, to be here first to meet you all. Some of you I've seen uh, already at congresses and so on, so I get a little bit of insight into your work. Um, but it's really a delight for me to be here and share with you basically, uh, uh, you know, some some research that we've been doing across the years on what is actually my favorite topic. I love to talk about this, and this is tumor budding. I'm not sure if any of you know what tumor budding is. Maybe just by a show of hands, have you heard of this before? Tumor budding? That's amazing. I'm so glad. Um, and, uh, and so basically there are three areas that I'd like to touch on today. Um, one is about tumor budding and being clinically relevant. So probably you've heard about tumor budding in the context of it being a prognostic factor important in patients with colorectal cancer. And I'd like to have a look at that evidence and also show you on which kinds of images that evidence was obtained from. The next question is about the the nature of buds, what makes it important as a clinical prognostic factor? And the third question is whether or not they actually exist. And the, the reason why we're even asking this question is because, and it's already been uh, maybe one or two decades, that this feature, which we see as single cells or small tumor cell clusters, has been debated by people who have looked in the z-axis in the third dimension and so it's kind of brought into question the whole idea of these single cells even existing and to add, to actually look at these three concepts or aims i want to basically travel a little bit through time and while doing this look at the different technologies that we've had in pathology and how the level of complexity has gotten higher and higher and how we can use that complexity to help answer this question. Um, so we're starting at the H and E stain, and then we'll work our way through single stains, double stains, immunofluorescence, spatial transcriptomics, spatial multiplexing, and then 3D. So that's kind of the, the aim for today. So to get us started, um, just to get everybody on the same sort of level of information, we're talking about colorectal cancer. And Colorectal cancer, these are numbers in Switzerland. So we have about 45,000 new cases of cancer uh, every year in Switzerland. In colorectal cancer, we have about 4,500 cases. So 10% of all new diagnosed cancer cases in Switzerland are cancer of the colon and rectum. And it's also the 10% 10, 10 of all cancer deaths are also those from colorectal cancer. And even though the survival rate has been improving over the last few years, and the last time, so even when I've been teaching a little bit about colorectal cancer, five years ago, this was 65% five-year overall survival rate. Now it's about 69%. So only 69% of patients with this disease are still alive after five years. This is not good. Um, for example, if you compare, for instance, globally to patients who have breast cancer, that's already 85, 90%. But colorectal cancer is somehow stuck in this uh, in, with, with not so much improvement and not so many treatment options. So the diagnosis of colorectal cancer, you know it's from histology. You all, or many of you, are working on histology. So that's really the thing we have in common here. And of course, you have a staging of the tumor. You have different gradings of the tumor. And you have a phenomenon called tumor budding which is now reported as part of the diagnostic reporting recommendations for colorectal cancer. And you will find those buds very typically around the invasion front of the cancer. So you can imagine what we're looking at here is basically like if the colon was a tube and the tumor was growing so towards the lumen and then inside, so going deep. And what you're seeing here is the top 
to the deeper and deeper level. So going deeper and deeper towards the fat. And it's growing in this direction. And we have a very clear direction of growth in colorectal cancer. And you would often find this feature located right where the cancer, which is all here, is basically pushing and pushing towards the stroma. And you find those tumor buds at that invasion front. Now, the reason why we care so much about looking for additional prognostic factors in colorectal cancer is because there's a particular group of patients who are stage two. These are patients who don't have lymph node metastases. There are their uh, regional tumors, but have still penetrated quite deeply into the different layers of the colon, and their prognosis can be widely different. If you look at different cohorts from around the world, patients are living, you know, after five years, you might have some cohorts showing only 20% or alive or 90% or alive. It's wildly different within that particular stage group. And that's why when we were running after this concept of budding, we, the aim was to be able to try to stratify patients in that particular subgroup into those who might be considered more high risk and try to identify those patients to be able to give additional therapy. So what does budding really look like? Budding looks like this. So you have on the left side, everyone is familiar with this H&E staining. And what you're seeing here are these disseminated single cell clusters. And actually the definition would be a single cell or a small group of tumor cells up to four. Who invented this definition? I can tell you about that later because everyone kind of has a question mark about all of that. Um, but nonetheless, it's a small group of tumor cells that is very typically found at the invasion front that looks dissociated from the main tumor um, and can also be found within the main body of the tumor. So if you took a biopsy, you could also see that. However, they're very much present at the invasion front. The H&E is somehow also tricky to visualize these tumor buds because they might take on the shape of fibroblasts or other, you know, that, that kind of a different cell type. They look, fibroblasts can be puffy um, when they're activated and it can get confusing. So in order to counter this problem, cytokeratin has been stained or used to identify tumor buds in a much better way. You can see what the arrows are pointing to. You see a nucleus, you see the nice cytoplasmic and membrane staining, it's cytokeratin, it stains for all epithelial cells, which also includes normal cells, but at least the tumor cells are all stained as well. And by having a look at the evidence about tumor budding across not only colorectal cancer, but many other different tumor types, but specifically in colon cancer, there is a question that keeps coming up or kept coming up, which was how on earth to score the presence of that feature along the border of the tumor? Because they're placed here and there and everywhere, is there a way to quantitate them? You know, how can we make this more reproducible, more objectively scored by pathologists? And there were many different scoring systems that were put front, you know, from the, you know, I mean, it's been now 20 years that this phenomenon has been pretty intensely studied. And regardless of how you cut it, the more buds, the worse the outcome. The more buds, the worse, you know, higher association with lymphatic vessel invasion, venous vessel invasion, metastasis, recurrences. It's all pointing in that direction. But how, if you wanted to include that in a standardized report, how would you be able to do that, you know, without being able to quantify that in a way that was reproducible? So then in Bern, we actually got uh, 23 experts from around the world. We sat at a table together. We spent three days talking about tumor budding. You can believe that. There is enough to talk about over three days for tumor budding. And we developed what became known as the International Tumor Budding Consensus Conference Guidelines or ITBCC Guidelines. For the, um, for the detection and quantification of budding. And basically, this is a microscopic way of doing it. So you scan the invasion front, you look at a 10x, you look for your hottest hotspot of buds, then you go down to 20x, and then you count how many buds you have in that particular microscopic area. And this actually, the budding became so important that it's now included in guidelines from ESMO, which is actually a huge accomplishment because the oncologists are enforcing now that budding be uh, included in reports. The CAP guidelines, so those are the pathology guidelines and even gastroenterology. Um, they are also interested in this, especially in the context of T1 uh, colorectal cancer. So, uh, yeah. So, yes. How does this help in treatment planning? If, in, the, if the oncologists are asking for it, yes. how does it help them? In yes. Deciding what treatment to give. Exactly. That's our keyword putting score up. 0.5 as compared to one. Yes. 
So basically, in the end, the ITBCC scoring criteria um, categorizes, that's my favorite thing in the, in the universe to do, right? You take a beautiful quantitative variable and you categorize it into three different groups, uh, BD1, BD2, BD3, it's called. Um, and in the stage two, so there are basically three different clinical scenarios where budding could have an impact. The first one is stage two colon cancers. That's that very heterogeneous group of, of patients where if you would have a BD3 tumor, which means more than 10 buds in that field, then those patients would be considered for adjuvant therapy. So additional chemotherapy in addition to surgery. So it's a major uh, factor. It's something that now they consider and they look at in the, the reports, of course, within the context of all other parameters, but it is one such parameter. The other one would be in the context of T1 tumors. That's why the gastroenterologists are actually interested because they can snip out polyps that might contain invasive components in there. And if that very early cancer even has some budding, so it's if they have BD2 or three, then that's actually an indication for a larger resection to be done. Because if buds are present and buds are associated with dissemination, then that's already a bad sign. So it's been shown that you have a lot more nodal, like lymph node involvement, if you have even a small amount of buds in a T1 tumor. Um, so it's better to suggest an endoscopic, uh, not an endoscopic, uh, 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 a hemicolectomy or a larger resection, let's say. So they would ask for this in the middle of um, taking that um, biopsy or resection? So normally the this T1, the T1 would come out in a biopsy. So this you might see because you can actually snip out the whole, you know, the, well, it depends, but yes, you would be able to do that. And in the stage two, of course, you, you receive the whole resection specimen. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's, you might have 10 slides of cancer, of tumor material. And then each one is evaluated. And then finally, the one with the hottest hotspot is selected and uh, it's reported. So you'd report, you know, um, 30 tumor buds per hotspot, BD3. And they, they now are using that information. Yeah. In principle, it's very similar to a multi cancer. To what, sorry? To mitotic counts. Oh, so to mitotic counts. Yeah. On a hotspot and then you have more Yeah. Yeah, it's similar to this. Yeah, yeah. Um, do we need a hotspot? Okay, we can talk about all of this yeah. stuff yeah. later. Maybe cover it yes. in your study. So what, what gives rise to these birds? In oh. those places? So, so then where, where are they coming from? Yes, I will cover that. Okay. Yes. So now, of course, the question arose, um, you know, is there a way that we can automatically quantify these buds? Because... Um, this is a task I think absolutely nobody wants to do ever, and <laughs> it's very tedious to count these. Um, and so the question would be, okay, well, let's focus on what kind of data we might be able to get for this. And the International Budding Consortium was quite occupied with trying to figure out how we could do this. So then, of course, they set out to, um, you know, try to develop a deep learning algorithm that would solve this problem. And so basically, of course, one needs to identify what these buds really are. And now we run into a kind of a problem because it's a problem of the ground truth. And I know I, I probably have put this like in every presentation that I have, but this is literally what it's like for, for, for budding. Unfortunately, we can't give this problem to anybody else but highly trained pathologists to solve to give us ground truth because it's not like you know, a chihuahua and a muffin you know, and trying to distinguish between these, um, it's really, you know, a, a tough problem to be able to decide, this one, this one's my favorite guy up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and now the other question about ground truth arises, if you give the same slide with, with the same object to different pathologists and you ask them to say, is this a bud or is it a larger bud? So the definition of a larger bud is like a poorly differentiated cluster. So that's like five or more cells that don't have a lumen, like a gland, glandular shape, um, and you, you give that to them and ask them, then this is, this, it's a difficult uh, result to live with. So for example, we, in this particular study, so the, this is from uh, John Miller Bokor, so he was doing the, he was a PhD student who just finished now working with Jeroen van der Laak and Iris Nachtigal. And basically here they have the h &E, which was restained. We were just talking about this the other, the other day yesterday. Um, which was restained with cytokeratin. Um, and then the object, the same object, which was in that box, was given to 11 pathologists to look at. And they were asked, is it a bud? Is it a PDC? Or is it nothing? Is it something else? And 
what is clear here is that in these, so this is the, the line for the, this is actually representing all 11 pathologists. So all 11 pathologists are agreeing that this object here is a bud, here too, here, oh, I think this is not, this is not on my computer here. Um, I think this one was also apparently seen as a bud, but then when you ask them to look at the same object in H and E, it, there's, a, there's a confusion that occurs. Some say it's a bud, some say it's neither, and it's almost like the object disappears. It doesn't look the same. So then how do we build something based on a ground truth that is wobbly? And what is crazy is even if you give, you know, the even if you would say, so in the end, what happened is that we took the consensus and then the consensus, I think it was like eight out of 11, if they agreed that it was a bud, then we it was classified as a bud. That's basically how it ended up happening. But I mean, it really drives home the point of like, how can we build something based on something that we don't even know is correct? So very, very tricky indeed. In, 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 can I? Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, one thing we tried with mitotic scoring is actually, you triply stay in the slide. Sure. Uh, no. Oh, uh, well, it yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it might put people to sleep, but I'm, it's okay. The risk is okay. <laughs> so so uh, we tried with mitotic scoring, you triply stay in the slide. Uh, so you add H, E, and a, uh, antibody stain yep. like that. And so in that, what we found is that it's easier for pathologists to score mitotic figures. Okay. I wonder if the question that you were asking is, how can we be sure that what we are seeing are actually worse? Maybe if you quickly stay in the slide, so you see the H and E, and on the same slide, we actually have the cytokeratin. Yes. As well. Yes. And then these parts would light up. Uh, so this is the same slide. So uh, this is no, the ex exactly on, on the same slide with H and E. So we have three stains. Oh, you mean you're visualizing it? Th oh, okay, okay. Yeah. At the same time. So I think, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think that I don't know whether anyone has done that. Or, uh, no, I think the most that was done is we kind of use the restain of the H and E, yeah. but not to actually visualize the same like the cytokine character on like on top of or with the other with the, stain. So you add three stains, three yeah. physical stains to the the, the tissue. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And then that way you get pink. Uh, purple and brown, the brown showing positive yeah, yeah, parts. Yeah. We can discuss that later. Yeah, that, that's great. In fact, we're doing something like this, but for immunofluorescence. Mm -hmm. But that's immunofluorescence that it becomes yeah. a bit. Different. Yeah, yeah. Just, I would comment on this. So we still have things we've done this. My job, follow up my job training to challenge the data of my process. But it was a rewatch. I suppose something like that we did here. What we found there was a limitation to what H and I don't think that approach. No, but I'm not. I'm not saying it's not a computational approach at all. There's no computer no. science involved in that. It's the it's the physical slide itself yeah. that is being stained with three strains, etchy, and um, you put the that that would, that because if you're doing it for all right. patients anyways, if it's a requirement for 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 then there's no point in marketing. We can we, we, we can discuss. Yeah, that. yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, there's a question. question from a from those online. He's asked. Can you train the AI on the IHC and get it to the Bible? Um, so the is So this is both the question you're asking. It's referring to getting an AI algorithm to detect the budding on the IHC and then seeing if you use that. So the IHC is the ground truth. I think that this was done, actually. I think that um, I know that in the end they have an algorithm, which is actually my next slide, that they have done uh, individually for the h &E and for the cytokeratin. Um, I'm pretty sure they tried to do one for the other as well. I cannot report here what the outcome was. This I cannot remember, but it's a very uh, good point. The other problem is that the, the immunohistochemistry chemistry has its own artifacts. So, I mean, even if you have, you get a better maybe visualization of the cell because of the nucleus and, this, and the cytoplasm around it, but it introduces other things that you would not have picked up on the AGE. So it's kind of um, the balance between them. So in the end, they they were end up. So the aim was to really try to build an algorithm for this. So they had a, basically a tissue segmentation that was originally performed, and then they outlined what the border was because that's actually where the buds need to be identified. And then they went in and looked for all of the tumor cells, well the nuclei, all nuclei, and then they looked for clusters that were up to four, and then they quantified that as a bud. And so they could you know do that in an automated way, identify the hot spots and then um, count the buds within those particular hotspots. You know, it's super nice, but it's also one of those problems where it's one of those great algorithms that we're never gonna use 
because how are we supposed to use it in real life setting? So it, it's, a, but that's a whole other bag of worms about integration and implementation, but the algorithm itself is cool. And so these two were published recently, uh, one for HD, one for Sadiq. That's it. So um, who is to decide for, and, and what happens if there are five sounds? <laughs> you know, biologically, nothing. I'd say it's, you know, come on. And it actually- It also depends on the cut. Absolutely. Stay tuned. I, I will talk about that. Yes, the sir. other thing is um, how far from the actually invasive tumor is what you would call a plant. If it's yeah. close to the tumor, you know. Sometimes, you know. What, what's the distance? What's the threshold? Okay, it would be so interesting to see how far they go because sometimes you really see it clearly pretty far away. Like you can almost, you see it like it almost has an aim like to go through, right? You can almost see like tracks. I've seen just one bite right at the periphery of the tissue in the very close to the margin, so far away from the actual tumor. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the distribution is like, but it wouldn't surprise me to see buds pretty far away. Um, but normally it's quite the, the front, how you define the front is more the question here because the front is more like 500 microns. I mean, how do we pick 500 microns? Who knows? We based it once because Gallon, his immunoscore, did 500 microns and called it an invasion front. So that's what we're doing. So like we take 500 microns from the invasion front. That's then my next question. Yeah. So immunoscore, is there any correlation between blood scores and immunoscore? Okay, I, I, I will also hold that question. Okay. Hold that thought. Okay. <laughs> we're, all, we're going in this direction. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, the other question that came up, and this is work from Metin Gurkhan's um, lab, uh, and probably you know this way better than me, but they were actually trying to generate synthetic images of budding um, and seemed to do this in a pretty good way. However, here they only had their one pathologist who was looking at what would really be a bud, and as we just finished saying, that's already a difficult task to do. So I guess as a pilot project to see, would it be possible to actually run such a, you know, to, to generate such images? seems to be the case. Um, but then again, the whole ground truth might be wobbly. So it would you know, merit kind of going a little bit deeper into, into that question. But in terms of annotating, budding, and using synthetic images to do that, when it's a very difficult task, is a, is a, cool, is a great idea. So I think with the HME studies and cytokeratin, basically what we can say is that um, we used these kinds of uh, scans, images, to define what budding was. Um, to do inter-observer studies of budding, which was also very interesting. Even if people are looking at different objects, they still come to the same budding score. And that is wild for me, right? So if you go object by object and you say bud or no bud, there's a discrepancy, which is major. But in the end, somehow the scores themselves come out fine. One of those things. Can I have one question? <laughs> Please. Um... Or hand colorectal cancer was uh, all the cancer tied up rely so, on tumor budding. Yes, so everything we actually have in this chart. So we had uh, done a review about this a couple of years ago. So it's maybe too small to, to read, but I'll just point it out. So we, colorectal cancer is probably the most intensively studied of the cancer types, but we've seen it in almost every solid cancer that we've looked at. Breast, pancreas, with huge impacts on prognosis, even in PDAC, in pancreas cancers where the survival of patients is already very bad. But if you looked at those that bud and it's almost like 80% of those cancers, bud, you will find them. Um, they even do even worse. Survival is only six months in comparison to two years. So I know there it's anyways, you're in a, in a severe context, but it seems to be a phenomenon occurring in lung, in esophageal and gastric, um, basically the entire jet lung. Um, and there they had an interesting idea, which also kind of inspired us a bit in lung cancers, where they also look at the cluster size. So we always kind of just bulk it like one to four cells. But is there like, is there a difference? Is there something related to a single cell? Is single cell more important? That kind of stuff. So there's a bit of work that's done in lung cancers on that. Is it that both of them the same thing? Hold that thought. <laughs> at least in colon cancer, we might have some evidence about that topic. Um, and so, and budding has been included in clinical trials. And I just got to say, just wrapping up this whole kind of first part, budding is important. Whatever we're seeing in histology in 2D as buds, it's important and should be reported. And it has value prognostically. Um, what a question. Yeah. So why, 
wider invasive spread did not define up the further tumor, but did not do far. So this is a good question. I mean, this is um, only how it's been defined now algorithmically. But I think if you're asking pathologists to do it themselves, they're not necessarily going to look at the front. They look where there is budding. And so they might zone in on something that is a little bit further away. How far can the buds go? This is a this is really nice. If we write a paper, we should do we could do this paper together, you know, to see how far the buds go. Um, and then no cool. you take different petals and see which ones have um, <clears throat> most relation with outcome. Yes. There's one question online as well from Yes. Yeah. So Professor made a comment about in melanoma, the distance from tumor of microinvasive foci had been well looked into. Melanoma reporting has defined a criteria where microinvasive becomes equivalent to intransit stasis and the first staging of PM1. Mm -hmm. Surely the same could be applicable to our tumor sites, which mm -hmm. I looked into, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so that goes in this direction, yeah, yeah. For melanoma, I really don't know about, about that disease, I have to say, that's not something I've looked into at all. Yes. It might be, sorry, um, would it be okay to conceptually think of these as nearby maps? Nearby maps. So, so, so tumor hasn't thrown them far away, just, they are still the same thing as max. They're not just that um, free to move, let's say. Well, you know, in um, in oral pharyngeal tumors, mm -hmm. they have a term which I, which maybe applies to what you're saying, which are satellites. Yeah. So they're almost like you know, like on the move, but they're I mean, metastases by definition wouldn't fit what maybe yeah. what you're saying, but like to have like a, a you know a my, you know, I'm trying to describe this stuff to my dad sometimes, right? <laughs> my dad is 83 years old now, right? And he, and basically he calls them like escapees. Yeah. So tumor cells that have escaped like from prison and they're out, they're running for it. It kind of looks like that. And they do change their, their biology. And I'm going to explain that right now. So it is mm -hmm. different and how that might revert back in a metastatic setting is something we're also really mm -hmm. looking into. But now the, the exact follow-up to this is, um, so what are these buds? So now that we know that their presence is important, what are they? And we've been hypothesizing all along about, um, you know, the fact that buds, or at least a subset of these buds, must be going under a biological process, a physiological process, called epithelial mesenchymal transition. This is something that is not only found in cancer. This is something that is found in normal, in normal physiology for wound healing and things like this. And that kind of a same process of cells that are epithelial, that they would normally stick, be bound together, held together by adhesion molecules, would somehow start to lose their adhesion. They would start to change a little bit their shape, which would allow them to cut through the stroma and take on properties of more mesenchymal cells. That means they become less um, apoptotic. They become more resistant. To, to, to different types of therapies. And they also become, they change their shape in the sense that allows them to migrate. And why do they want to do that? Because I guess, you know, they're trying to cut through muscle and, and so on and so forth. So to be able to change their shape a little bit would be beneficial. And they might take on, you know, proteins and so on that allow them to be able to kind of degrade what is in front of them so that they can go through it. Otherwise, how can we explain their presence so far away from the tumor as well? So we were thinking epithelial mesenchymal transition, that's gotta be a key to this whole story, at least in, in some way. Uh, are you saying that the evolutionary pressure of the tumor against normal cell kickstart the transition of the emergence of tumor, but in cell? I don't know if it's evolutionary pressure, um, I don't know if anyone knows actually why buds start to, to, to take place. It could really be that it is an interaction with the, so I also show this later, with the immune, the immune system in a way that either, you'll see that there is also, tumor grows, tumors may grow in various shapes, and you know, of course you know that, and there, there are some that really grow almost like balls, like they're very much circumscribed, and they just like press forward like this, and in those cases, you almost never see budding. And then you have the cases that grow like fingers. Those are the more dangerous ones. And then these ones seem to give off buds. So, and these ones very often don't have an immune response that counteracts them. 
So it's like a whole bunch of different things. I mean, no one really knows what might stimulate them. We did do a study one time to look at driver mutations. Like, is it a subclone? Someone was mentioning about subclones also the other day, or today actually. Subclones, like a, a set of mutations that belongs to buds that might trigger them to, to do that. And the answer definitely is no. So there are no like new mutations that occur or driver mutations that occur in buds that might have led to them doing that. But perhaps more and more of this story might clear up. The next thing we started to do and others have done is to look at the expression within these buds because we're trying to understand it. If our hypothesis is true, you would expect you'd have a lot of proteins being upregulated that are related to migration, invasion of tumor cells, degradation of the extracellular matrix, all of this stuff. And you find that, let's have that. Or downregulation of metastasis suppressor genes. So again, it all points towards metastasis. So it all points in that direction. However, the one thing that was clear, like if we are right about our hypothesis of epithelial to mesenchymal transition, this is a state of two cell types. One is epithelial, one is mesenchymal. You would assume you got to catch some cells in a state of double of this, like in a state where epithelium and mesenchyme come together. If that's possible, we would have to see that. We thought we would look at cytokeratin and vimentin. Vimentin is another protein that is specific for mesenchymal cells. And could we find a double stain, a double phenotype in the buds? And the answer is yes, we could do it. So for us, this was like a huge breakthrough. This is one of those things we, we were even like uh, talking about yesterday. Sometimes your, your least cited paper or your least, your paper that you put in the lowest thing ever ends up being your most important, most best paper ever. And for me, I think that, you know, uh, a few years ago, definitely this was for us, you know, we published this in human pathology or something like that. But we could, using three different approaches, find a subset, not all. It was between 3 and 20% of all buds that seemed to be in the transitory state. So we could do it by visualizing under a confocal microscopy, but we could also do it using, you know, fact sorting, a special, a special way of fact sorting out cells and focusing only on areas that had tumor buds, for instance. Uh, one question. Yeah. How close did you observe? these with the vimentin near the, the front that you mentioned, how um, far away? Oh, so I don't remember exactly for these specific examples how far that was away, but I presume it's not, they're not really too, too far, I would say. Depends also what we mean by far because it's the growth of the tumor. So if you imagine in colon cancer, if we think about T1, T2, T3, and T4, if you're already in the muscle, I mean, Make me up. So it kind of depends a little bit on where you're already in the, where is yeah. the invasion front? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So then if we are looking, if we're back to a histomor, so an a H and E plane, our good friend here, H and E, and we're looking at, you know, a colorectal cancer and we focus in on a very interesting area. I mean, gosh, there's a lot going on. Like this is not just cancer cells, you know, epithelial cells you're really looking at a, you know, an, an amazing sort of network of different things going on here, all of this immune reaction or inflammatory reaction against the cancer. And sometimes the buds, you can almost see them like dripping. They're almost like more like extensions off or like you can see that they want a bud. They're like protruding off of it. And all of this comes together in an amazing micro environment or micro community right <laughs> and you know and and to, to look at that so it can't be that the cancer cells are just there by themselves as being important so we get to complicate the story even more and we start thinking in our minds of the buds or cancer cells being the attackers and the immune response against those buds as being the defenders or other cell types as well but we're thinking about it in the first step what is the balance between the attack of the buds versus the, you know, the immune reaction against those buds. And is there an impact? So we're not, we're kind of stepping a bit away from the idea of looking at one thing at a time. So this was actually my first project when I was in Basel, looking at 300 patients with stage two colorectal cancer that were double stained. So this was all the rage then. Like, I mean, we were doing this like crazy. We had like 10 or how many there are here, double stains 
on 300 patients. So this means more than 3,000 slides where I, I, poor me, right? I evaluated 10 hotspots along the borders of every single of these slides. And I counted the amount of buds and the amount of immune cells in every one of these hotspots. And then I got a value. And then I didn't know what to do. So we just like divided them. And then there we go. That's our model, right? Um, and, and, and how did that work out? It turns out it works out brilliantly because if you were to include this, the buds on the one hand, but the CD8 on the other hand, and there were some other markers that came out as being important, Fox P3, or T-Rex and so on and so forth, you could kind of put them into an equation and be able to stratify your patients into wildly different groups instead of it being somehow less uh, stratified. And so this means what? This means that there is an added value of looking into an additional component of the microenvironment if we're trying to you know, look at buds. This brings us back to the immunoscore question. So the, the, the budding that is occurring there, the immunoscore is kind of like, you look at the center of the tumor, you look at the invasion front of the tumor, you, you look at five of the hottest hotspots and five of the hottest hotspots at the invasion front, and then you say, is it low, is it high in the center or in the invasion front? For CD3 and CD8, which sounds redundant, it is, but anyway, um, and then in the end to see if it combines, and it's true that if you would combine it in the same way, you get the same thing. So immunoscore is valuable, budding is valuable, but even better is to combine them. Can you have um, that kind of data? Okay. Yes, you know what, it just came out. I think if it, did, if it didn't just come out, it's in a uh, uh, publication somewhere. And not by, so it's by the group, but with Tariq uh, Hadid from Iris Nachtigal's lab. I think he's the, the first author on that uh, paper. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the immune cells around the, these birds, what kind of immune cells you find? Yes. So, uh, I, so I don't have that data here. What we have a lot of are the T lymphocytes. Um, and nowhere do we find B lymphocytes. So they're like nowhere around. And I'm kind of glad about this because we had had the idea to also try to make an H and E immunoscore. And then the question would be like, it would be diluted then with B cells, but there is no B cells so around. Kind of B cells. Uh, so this, so T cells, I can't tell you by heart, actually. I'd have to look at the paper again. You're um, looking at cytopoxic and T-Rex. Yeah, but I think we had like CD4 in there, CD3 in there. Um, uh, I think we looked at, uh, we had some uh, activation markers. We had granzyme B to here. Uh, what do we have? CD8, CD3. Uh, be, oh, that's it. It would be really interesting to see if they are cytotoxic or not. Uh, and if they are not cytotoxic, what is the outcome? Yes. That's... I'm pretty sure we, not in this study, but there is one where we added on TIA, actually it's TIA, TIA1 as a cytotoxic molecule similar to granzyme B, which could be more easily quantified in addition to the CD8s. Um, but I can't remember offhand what, it was several years ago, but there is certainly literature on that. Yeah. But yeah, I see the point. Like if it's not activated, it's still a little point. Yeah, sorry, I think it's still <laughs> oh. So I'm very conscious about your time and say I'll be, we've got about 20 minutes left. So oh man, I gotta rush through. Yeah. Okay. okay, yes. Okay, so then comes Peter Kai, and he's like able to do all of this stuff by quantifying it and using some spatial proximity analysis. So wouldn't you believe that? So basically they're looking at this in immunofluorescence, and then they're able basically to say every bud is sort of like what you see here in, uh, in as a black point, sort of in the middle, in that middle diagram. And all they're doing is looking at the spatial proximity, proximity to the nearest CD8 and CD3s. And they're doing it in a quantitative way. And when I saw this, I wanted to fall from my chair because I thought, where was this, you know, when I had to do 3,000 slides? And here you basically see in this, um, in the, the there, these are three different data sets. You had a training, testing, and validation data set where you can see the first row is T stage, then it's tumor budding, then it's just immune cells, and then it's budding plus immune cells. And you can very well see in these three groups that humongous stratification when you're adding both components together. So that's really the value in looking at a more complex environment.
We had one of our students, Linda, who also tried to do the same, but she was using graphs. And so she basically was looking at, this was the situation we were talking about before in the T1 tumors, to see if one could predict who might be low risk or high risk and have to go for surgery afterwards based on how, based on basic, the results of the graphs. And not getting into this, because probably you know anyways about these things way more than I do, about how she connects tumor buds to the near to the CD8 positive T cells, because she was doing double immunohistochemistry here for cytokeratin and CD8. And you can already see the complexity of the graphs seems to be much higher in the high risk group. So even just by eye, it's, it's clear. But then the question keeps going, right? It's like, okay, now we looked at tumor cells and now we looked at immune cells. Great. Now what? What about the fibroblasts? What about the phenotyping of the T cells? What about the vessels, the extracellular matrix? Like it goes on and on about all the different components we could possibly be looking at. And how are those coordinated, organized within the tissue? And how do we study that and all of this? So for the usual instruments that we might have in pathology labs, we reach a limit with being able to look at two, three markers at a time. If you have a bond instrument, you can look maybe for a triple staining. If you are able to perform OPAL, you might have three stainings or a little bit more, five stainings, something like that, but it won't answer your questions. So what do we do about this? Well, now we have these beautiful machines on the market, right? That allow you to multiplex or look at cons consecutive, you know, stainings of two antibodies at a time that you just, you stain and you image, then you remove it, then you stain and you image and you remove it. And all these images are co-registered together to be able to make an image with potentially a hundred different proteins at one time. And that's basically where, where we were thinking, this is gonna be great for us. So let's make our first panel, which is a 31 plex uh, marker panel that would cover these various um, cell types. And if we could use this as a start for trying to look at our budding problem. Of course, if this is a very targeted approach, I mean, you're not discovering something new in terms of new proteins, new genes, you know what you're looking for in terms of, at least you know what you wanna look for when you're devising such a panel. And now this is why the lights are off because I wanted to start showing these images here um, and, and kind of just wow you with the things that you can see. So. I'm just showing five stains at a time because our eye can't, can't possibly deal with more, but you can see how beautiful these are. And in the last, just this last square here, what you're seeing actually in magenta is, uh, or in pink, this is our, our buds. And just next to it, you have our um, CD8 positive T cell, CD3 positive T cell, T cell, I should say. And I love seeing things like this, like, Oh, the things you see under histology are really inspiring for other, other things to come. So here's an image of cytokeratin. So now keep your eye a little bit on this area here, which seems to contain quite some budding, right? So there we have our cytokeratin. And then we start to add on EPCAM, which is surprisingly negative over, over there in that corner. And then we have CDX2, so our, my, my favorite protein, uh, which also seems to be lost a little bit in that budding area. We add on CD3, then we keep going with alpha smooth muscle actin, so we know where we are within the tissue anyways, right, to get that, that overview. And then we keep going. We have beta catenin, which should be membranous and uh, cytoplasmically located, and apparently we should see some nuclear staining of these buds. To be honest, I haven't seen that recently in any of the slides I've, I've looked at, but okay. CD68, we've got the macrophages. We've got ZEB1, which is a transcription factor that should be elevated in EMT cells and leads to, and is also a, a repressor of ECOD here. And anyway, fibroblast activating protein, you know, fimented. I mean, look at this. The information that you can get from these images is, is completely wild. Then here you have ECOD here, and we continue with our CD163, that's for macrophage typing, CD8, CD31 for the vessels. That's another question, how far are the buds from vessels and mice and light chain for uh, muscle? And then finally, we have ECOD here and caspase 3 for apoptotic cells, lamin B1, T67. And I mean, it just goes on and on. And you can just keep doing that. And the morphology is maintained. That's the most amazing thing. At least we haven't seen it, you know, get a little bit wish-washy after 
uh, many of these runs. So, I mean, we haven't gotten to 100 proteins, but at least after 30 proteins, we don't seem to see the problem. And you can then go really deep into that. And this is so nice because you know that you're looking at, at a cell that is a T cell, that is a CD positive cell that is active. And you combine it all together and you have an amazing phenotyping of these cells. And not only that, then you can see it's also proliferating, for instance. So, I mean, this is an amazing tool to get some new insight into, you know, biology potential. So, yeah. Because obviously, doing this analysis by eye, there's a limit to that. If you've got 100 channels, <laughs> it's going to take you forever. Absolutely. So, no one does it by eye. <laughs> so what, what, what we really need is tools that can allow you to, um, to analyze all possible combinations. Yes. Right? Because yes. there may be some other phenotype that you don't even know about. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, you use mining tools for pulling out the kind of phenotypes that might be biologically and clinically relevant. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, right now, for instance, we're making a, um, a 30 marker, it's an immune panel, it's specific for the immune, immune cell populations. So one could really get into deeper and deeper phenotyping, finding new things, like there are new populations of CD4 positive, PD1 positive cells, like, and apparently those could have cytotoxic potential, like, there are things that you'd never know before that you can start to discover with this. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of information. And this is single cell. Like if we're talking single cell, this is single cell, up to a hundred features on a single cell, for instance. And the question is, it's nice, beautiful pictures. We can make a calendar, it's nice, but is it useful, right? And so we're looking into this now. I can't share everything today because I, really I, I really hope that we'll be able to publish relatively soon about this. But looking at whole slides and looking at biopsies on a TMA cohort, these are patients who have been, um, you know, treated with preoperative therapy, and we're like trying to predict the outcome using what we're seeing here from all of this marker panel. What we found to be very helpful is this like square that you see on the top right, which is like our code book for how we want to identify cell types, because you have to know at least what you're looking at, like how do you identify what is an activated CD8 positive T cell. So it's like a code book that we, so that we're also making sure our stainings are valid, right? Um, so we based ourselves on this. And of course, now we're looking into how to deal with this data, how to do a spatial analysis on this data. And there are a lot of techniques that are coming up from many different groups right now, how to do it, how to normalize data, how to set thresholds, how to batch correct. Um, all of these topics, which I know are very familiar to every person here probably, every bioinformatician dealing with these problems, and so are we, um, and we're doing it to the, to the best of our ability. And in terms of, you know, this is just another example of looking at, you know, uh, cytokeratin positive cells where we can clearly see that if the cluster is maintained, we have e coherent, which is a cell adhesion molecule, which is still there, but in the bud, it's disrupted or completely gone, you know, and we can kind of study these features that are ongoing. So one thing that was very nice to us was just in a first pass to see that within the invasion front versus the tumor center, we're already getting differences in marker expression, which we kind of expected would happen, but we're glad to see it because this is the first multiplex experiment that we've really kind of uh, dived and delved dove into. Um, and the same thing on the budding side, that you see loss of beta catenin, of CDX2, of E. coli. So something is really going on within those buds, and we can show it here. Even though we've had single staining studies to look at that, now we can show it on the same buds, you know, same buds showing this phenomenon. And this is just a little bit of a teaser just to show that, in fact, we can see it. Our so called hybrid EMT phenomenon that we were thinking about, that buds go through a sort of epithelial to mesenchymal transition that cannot be complete. They did not lose entirely their epithelial compo component. Otherwise, how would they, in our minds, how would they be able to form a metastasis later and be able to reattach and adhere and form a metastasis? But there definitely is a transitionary state that goes from epithelial somewhere to mesenchymal and somewhere in between um, we see that, 
And so I'm kind of freaking out about these results because um, we actually have that evidence to show that there is something like a hybrid state where there is this nice epithelial loss and how this relates to clinical endpoints. I will have to say we got away for the paper so that I can tell you about. Now, the only thing is, is that here we're hypothesis driven. We know what to look for and we're not going to discover anything new in that sense, right? I mean, because we know what we are looking for. But of course, there are technologies out there. Some of you are very familiar with such things. I know sitting in this room where you can do spatial profiling, where you can look at the whole transcription, transcription. that means 18,000 genes that you can look at in very small little spots across the tumor and try to deal with that, try to deal with that data, basically, and to look for something new, to discover new genes located in areas that you can see shifting throughout the tumor and be able to use that in a second step for validation or for understanding biology better. And now, of course, the, all the rage is to go into the single cell stuff to be able to say, this is not, not budding, these are just normal colonic crypts, but to, to be able to look at a thousand genes or a little bit more in every single cell that you'll find on your tissue slide. And this is, of course, a lot of information, but... Uh, it would be interesting to know what will come of this. However, in the last part, so just in the last two minutes, I wanted to show two videos. This first one is from the group at Harvard who was um, looking at budding in 3D. So the aim here, what they did is they took a tissue section and they stained it with some a couple of markers, but they cut through the whole block. So they cut the block, so the, the tissue block, they cut it down, they stained each of these sections, and then they built back, like they co-registered all the, all, the, all the images and then they could get their Z plane. And everything that you're seeing in yellow should have or would have been considered budding on the, on the one, one level. And then you start to see that, huh, it starts to kind of look like things are connected. We're not really seeing a lot of true like single cells or whatever we've been claiming for the last 10 years or so, right? So this was pretty interesting for us. Then I kind of got together with another guy. Uh, his name is John Liu. He's a person who does light sheet microscopy. He's uh, at the University of Seattle in Washington. And they have a way of imaging without cutting the specimen. They image the entire block. So they clear the block and then they image it um, using light sheets and are able then basically to look for structures um, using their sort of H&E, uh, how do they call it? Like a, like a, it's not H&E staining, it's a, like um, something similar to H&E, which they are using then to color the block. And they can also, of course, perform multiplex and so on. So this is the thing that really blew my mind, everybody. We're getting to the end of this whole story. Keep your eye on these two red dots, right? These two red dots are actually, I mean, this was seen by pathologists on the so-called H&E, looked like, those two dots are single buds. Now we're going to turn on the cytokeratin sort of uh, staining, and they look pretty much like separated cells. Now what's going to happen is, because this is a 3D image, we're going to look at how that looks like, and everything in yellow is connected. How is it connected? We're going to show you in this next, uh, in this next picture here. Check this out. They are connected through larger structures as a branch. So actually, the buds that we see on that 2D plane deeper are actually forming one branch and are like two branches off of a main trunk. So, okay, so then at this point we were thinking, oh, geez, okay, we've been, you know, the whole time we're talking about how these are single cells, dissociated cells, oh my goodness. Um, then let's see what happens in a second example. So here again, you will have um, two dots that you're kind of focusing on. So two buds that are appearing um, in this 2D space. It looks like buds. Then we turn it on for the cytokeratin. Here they are. That's these ones, two buds here. And then we go again, looking at it in 3D, consider everything yellow as connected. These two are connected. So how are these two points connected? Look at this. So they are again connected via this big branch. So then we start thinking, well, maybe the concept of single cell doesn't even exist. Like, is this really 
is everything connected? And that's really just, we're seeing it like an artifact this whole time. And then this third example, so here we have on the right side, exactly what you're seeing here. And to our relief, I guess I can say it, we have objects that are in fact individual single cells in addition to those, of course, that form larger branches. So the answer is yes, buds do exist. They are only about 15% of every object that we see as a bud at least in the first examples that we've seen here. Um, so we need, to, we need to look really much more deep. But imagine 85% of what we see as budding on a 2D plane are connected objects, whereas only 15% are really away from the tumor. And it would now be, of course, amazing to be able to investigate those sort of true single cell buds and how they differ from those on fibrils. So we started calling them like fibrils, um, extensions, right, branches which is obviously more for, it's a morphology pattern that you're seeing, like the more torturous a tumor grows, the more like, you know, the more not smooth, the more convoluted it grows. This is what we're basically seeing as a reflection of budding, I guess, you know, and that morphology, that tumor growth pattern, it comes back to tumor growth pattern. And that's what we need to, that's what we really need to study. It all makes sense. Tumor stroma ratios, CMS classifications, all comes back to tumor growth patterns. And this is uh, just a meme that uh, we made. This is the one that doesn't have mute, that doesn't have mute. <laughs> you know, those are like those two famous dogs from Instagram and it's like so stupid. And I always, I, I, I would ask myself if I should really show this because it's like so stupid. But actually that's literally how I felt um, when I was seeing those buds disappear for the first times, just complete confusion. So anyways, um, bringing all of this to an end, you see how all these different technologies has helped us over time, have helped us over time to sort of get an idea of this process and to, re to help us to reconsider um, what we thought we were seeing. Um, so there's a lot of work that, that needs to still be done and the 3D technologies are on the rise. I think they will be really important for understanding more and more about what is going on in, in in cancer, it's already been making an impact. Um, and so let's see what's gonna happen for the future, but I guess we are all not out of a job anytime <laughs> soon. So that's my group. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody. For being here. That is one thing that I have in mind. How would these cells, isolated cells we support here, how would they manage to stay alive by themselves? What if I, I think of a uh, simple way of explaining it is kind of like a full piece of paper and just getting a plane out of it. Yes. And then you've got these valleys which would show wouldn't show up in a plane, but they would have these these different bars. But as you said, it's a measure of tumor irregularity, so it's a useful feature regardless. Yes. What, whether it's connected or not. Yes. Right? Normally, if if I talk about this, then pathologists start to get really worried. Like, oh, do we still need to do the bunny? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Regardless of what it is representing. It is important. It's just now we know it represents maybe something different than we originally thought, but whatever. I mean, that's still absolutely fine. And there are these single cells, they can go through this, what they call, it's like a noikis resistance. It's death that they can resist death that normally would have occurred by being not attached to neighbors because that's how they're getting their, their livelihood basically. But even as a single cell where it's not attached, it's supposed to die but it doesn't, and it can. It, and these are proteins that are upregulated in these cells too. So it's it kind of also works in their favor. There is biology behind it to support that this would function. Yeah. Thanks, Cynthia. That was a really great talk. So just before we uh, we, we finish, so we've got about fifteen minutes until we need to leave for a taxi. Oh yeah. I know that Nasir also wanted to speak to you before you left as well. So should we do another five minutes of questions? So that I know lots of people have got lots of questions. So if anyone's got any burning questions, they can go first, I think. So I know Buzz has also asked quite a few questions on the chat. So Buzz, do you want do you want to uh, have you got a question you'd like to ask Inti to finish with? Do you still hear Buzz? Hi, that's I'm sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you okay. Did you did you ask something? 
Yeah, so you, you've, you've asked quite a few, um, you've sent a, quite a few questions throughout the talk. I was wondering if there was a specific question that you wanted to ask in to uh, the Um, Could we clone you and just keep one of you in Derby? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually, you're better off in Warwick. Um, no, no, I think there were just really comments at the periphery from a pathologist point of view, really. It was, it's kind of, um, the work, it, it, it's sensible to suggest that obviously budding will be important, but, but I wonder, because of the limitations of a pathologist's brain and eyes and time, I think problems like you're working on are exactly the best place for digital pathology. Um, uh, I, I was also wondering if you were aware uh, or knew of anybody using your similar tools like your multi-immunohistochemical phenotypes on lymphomas or leukemias, because they're the cell type. Um, we're looking for both those expressions within the tumor for, for, for uh, diagnostics, but also their phenotype will be expressed in the surrounding inflammatory cells. Do, yes. do you know if anyone's doing work on that? Yes, yes. There is a paper published a couple of years ago by Darcy Phillips as the first author. Um, they, so the work was put in, uh, so they're collaborators of Gary Nolans from Stanford who wrote exactly about lymphomas and they call they've kind of developed a so-called spatial score, looking at um, several different markers, but they've, so they were able in a very nice way, and we kind of use this as an example for our studies, how to reduce the dimensionality down from looking at spatial transcriptomics analyses, which is like very, very large and wide, down to something that oncologists might at the end of the day also want to know, and they don't want to overcomplicate things, right? So their so-called spatial score ended up being something that was like, uh, I think it was something like CD4 and PDL1, but with a spatial measurement associated to that. And they could differentiate responders to non responders for immunotherapy in a pretty dramatic way. So maybe you'd want to see that paper. That's the, just the first one that pops into my mind. No, I, I will. Thank you. Uh, the other one I was wondering do you think there's a limitation behind using epithelial immunostochemical markers as an adjunct? Because it, uh, maybe for microinvasion, it's less important, but um, uh, like you describe, the, the 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 changing genotype and phenotype of the tumors becoming more mesenchymal and less epithelial can be reflected in the immunostains. Where Absolutely. the worst um, tumors we find um, in all all epithelial tumors, all of them have the potential to be sarcomatoid, but at that point, they're no longer epithelial yeah. mark positive. Yes. So this is a this is a question we're asked all the time because we're using the cytokeratin almost like to define the bud, but then we're claiming that it should be going through a transition where they lose their cytokeratin. So it's kind of a, a you know a double edged kind of a thing here. Um, so I definitely agree with that. Um, so we've thought about how to counter that problem. So if it's something that would be cytokeratin negative, how would we know that it would come from the tumor? Um, and we've had that that thought where we've we've done um, for example, BRAF mutated tumors by immunohistochemistry, where you would find staining for you know BRAF uh, V600 E pro like the the mutated protein um, in all of those tumor cells to see if there's something that for example we're missing that would have not come out in the cytokeratin in our small set of um, of samples that we've looked at. The answer is no. We've never come across that. But it is true, we don't know how much we're missing um, if we're limiting ourselves to defining our process by an epithelial marker. You are right. Um, if uh, I'm sorry for the follow-up questions. If there are other people, please tell me to, to cut me off. But, but I was wondering, um, have you looked at the differential, uh, have you looked at the expression strength of your immunist chemical like epithelial yeah. markers? Because yes. that would presumably correlate with your genetic landscape. Yes, and we can certainly see. So not only uh, not only is it uh, from our group. Sorry, here the the, the window just stopped. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, we definitely when we quantify it, we can see that there is a, a much uh, a much uh, decrease, so a large decrease in cytokeratin expression in the buds. Um, and there are others who have also done similar studies looking at the RNA level. So they've done laser capture microdissection and then done gene expression profiling of those single buds that they've laser captured also finding a decrease in cytokeratin and an increase in vimentin actually in those individual buds. Just, just Fantastic, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so the differences that you saw between bars and other tumor cells, mm -hmm. 
If they are connected, then that means in theory, any tumor cells at the extreme of the tumor would also have similar patterns. So they should be indistinguishable from you, from, from, uh, from, from birds. So the differences that you show in one of the PC, yes. PC plot, are those differences due to budding or just extremity of yes. the tumor? So we can say that for sure that the so-called EMT process is not limited to budding. Yeah. And you will find that in the extensions, in those fibrils, you can already see those changes occurring. So you're right. It's mm -hmm. almost, we wouldn't be able to distinguish that. It's a process that goes on from the center. The center of the tumor is much different. But yeah. when it starts to get yeah. into fibrils, and then we have a couple of amazing pictures that we've seen when you see the whole projection like this, and you can see that transition. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And it might be. I'm out of my depth here, definitely. So if you are able to make a, a Petri dish model of these, let's say, and you can try different cell lines, and has anyone really designed a, a like given a bunch of different drugs to cells at the extremities of tumors just to be able to contain them? Uh, so this I don't know. I've never come across something like that. What we have tried to do is make, so take primary tissue samples for patients and grow them in 3D culture. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of not the same kind of a model that we're interested in. What we have also done is we've done these um, chick, so CAM assays, these like chick allantoic membrane assays, mm -hmm. where you take cells that you've genetically manipulated and you open up an egg, a chicken egg, right? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of just place the cells on the membrane and then you wait for it to grow into a tumor. And then you see what happens there. Is budding occurring or not? And so we've looked at CDX2 in this context, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, and there, it's, you can also see how the tumor is kind of, elongating and forming fibrils, and there are very few buds in this particular model, but at least it's an in vivo model, you know, or ex vivo but model. But if you take the same cell and like copies of the same cell, have different petri dishes, yeah. give different drugs to each, do a drug screen on, on which drugs are effective to target these cells that are in the extremities, that might be a way of discovering. Yeah. I mean, you're right that we've always, in addition to EMT, we imagine that these are like stem cell-like cells. Mm -hmm. You know, they have these properties of stem cells because if we're correct, then those buds is a, is it is also a mechanism of metastasis, and those mm -hmm. those cells would remake a tumor in another place, mm -hmm. which would give you know so that it's in line with the stem cell properties. And those ones are difficult to to blast, right? They're difficult to kill, um, so they're very quite resistant to therapy and so on. So this is a whole area we can potentially look at, yeah. Yeah, we have one final question. Um, thank you very much. And then the last one comes. Um, it might be a naive question, but toward the end of your presentation, we get when you got close to the conclusion that lots of these parts are obviously these are the, the complex and branching morphology of the tumor growing and proliferating widely. Have you looked, or do you think it would be a good idea to look into the association or correlation? Or any connection between the, the bots population that you measure with some measurement of tumor morphology regularity, the, the tumor front irregularity, you can measure it with yeah. some geometrical measures, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you think it will be uh, relevant to look into that or they, they will be related? Meaning that if you can, if there is a really great association between them. You might not want to go and look and find in, in fine bots, just look at the morphology of it. I think you're right. And if we could do that in 3D, it would be the best. Um, but I do think that what you see in 2D is already a pretty good reflection because you almost never find, so the opposite might not be true, but if you're looking at pushing border tumors, which really exist, the mucinous tumors are like this, mucinous tumors don't really bud. And, and the ones that are really kind of growing encapsulated and they're pushing, with a pushing border, as we call it, those ones you almost never see anybody, never. So that kind of a morphology is already indicative of that. Whereas I would say, yes, if you look at tumors where you see scatteredness, um, it's probably a direct reflection of that. I really think it's like the tumor growth pattern is really gonna be maybe enough to say, this is bad. I mean, you ask any pathologist who's looking down the microscope, they look at it and say, oh, this is a bad one. Mm -hmm. How do they know that it's bad? You know, they're looking exactly at this, the tumor growth, you know, patterns and right. many other things, but it's so indicative of that. So yeah, it's probably just one surrogate of a larger kind of, you know, thing, or maybe not. Maybe it is true that 
those buds that are really single cells are really the you know really bad resistant EMT like stem cells that are going to make the failure to the treatments. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, I think we're going to have to uh, call, this, call this a to a close there. So should we uh, thank Inti again?